Hi, everybody. I'm Nadia Khan, a real estate agent with the EXP Realty Luxury Division. And today I'm here with Lynn Wang, who's an attorney specializing in estate law and asset protection. I know I'm not only speaking for myself and for my clients when I say that estate planning can be very confusing. Uh, so if you're curious about wills and trusts or you're planning to buy or sell real estate, then be sure to watch this video because we're going to answer some very common questions. So Lynn, thank you so much for being here today. Um, the first question that I have is for people with assets in the United States, what kind of legal documents should we have to protect our assets if we're uh, incompetent or deceased? Thank you very much, Nadia. And uh, if we are incompetent or if we pass our way, what kind of legal documents will help us? So first, let's say if we are incompetent or if we pass our way, our assets will be at risk because we don't have the ability to manage our assets to protect our assets anymore. And if we are incompetent, so who will manage and take over the assets? For example, have we ever imagined a situation where we are incompetent, but we own a house jointly with our spouse? So actually, in this situation, our spouse cannot sell the house by him or herself at all, because the house is owned jointly by both us and them. So both of us and them need to sign the documents to handle the assets. So if either of us, either the husband or the wife, cannot sign the documents, the assets cannot be sold out. So if we want to make sure if we are incompetent, we will not subject our spouse to the situation where they cannot handle the assets and vice versa. We need to have two kinds of documents. First, it's financial power of attorney to say if we are incompetent, who will make the financial decision for us? And second, it is the medical power of attorney. That is saying if we are incompetent, who will make the medical decision for us? And with the authorization paper, if we are incompetent, our families can take over our assets and medical decisions. And second, if we pass our way, what will happen to our assets? If we don't have any documents to arrange how our assets will be distributed, if we pass our way, our assets will be subject to probate court when we pass our way. The probate court is a part of the American court system. And in this system, the court will figure out who gets what according to the American legal hierarchy of inheritance. So they will find out whether we have surviving spouse and children, if not, whether we have surviving parents, if not, whether we have surviving siblings, surviving nieces and nephews and cousins, like level by level. And in this process, usually they will take us Five to 15% of whatever we have when we pass our way. It means if we have $1 million, the government will charge us 50K to 150K to go through the probate court process. Mm -hmm. And also the whole process can take us one to two years. And in the more populated states, like the United, like in the United States, like New York and California, sometimes it can take us three to five years. And in the process, our private information will be disclosed to the public so the potential people can claim to our assets. So if we want to protect our time, our privacy, our money, we should have will and trusts to arrange how our assets will be distributed if we pass away. So the government will not be involved and we can protect our assets from the tedious process. Thank you. Wow, that's a great explanation. Thank you. I didn't realize that the government took a portion of that. Um, so that's very good to know. Um, my next question is, uh, when, while people aren't as familiar with wills, um, a lot of people are confused with trust. Um, what is the difference between a will and a trust? Yeah, wills and trusts, they always come like hands by hands, like they always come together because their function is very similar to each other to distribute our assets after our passing our way to regulate who gets what. However, the process can be very different for the will and the trust. 
because for a whale, it is owner, only the four corners of a paper. It's black and white to see who gets what. But it is not recorded anywhere. So if we pass away, we have to go to the probate court, the court we just mentioned, to verify the authenticity of the whale documents. Because we send the documents, we take it back home, and perhaps we pass away 10 years afterwards, 30 years past war, afterwards, and even longer afterwards. So it means like perhaps our document has fraud over there. Perhaps other people make some changes to our documents when it is inappropriate. So before the government, the probate court, makes sure that it hasn't happened yet. So the will cannot be executed. The asset cannot be distributed according to the will rules. So if the asset and the, the documents go through the probate, we still need to pay the 5 to 15% of the processing fee. We still need to wait for one to two years or even three to five years for our families, for our loved ones to recover our assets. It still needs us to make our private information, especially the asset information, family information, and document information to the public. So if we have a trust, it is not only about the black, black and white paper to see who gets what, but we need to record our assets under the name of the trust. For example, if I have a house, if I want it to be protected by the trust, we need to go to the county clerk's office, the deed recording office, to record the asset under the name of the trust. And if we have like, for example, a bank account, like a stock account, we need to go to the corresponding financial institutions to record the assets under the name of the trust. So the beneficiary will be the trust. It means if we pass away, the assets will be distributed according to the trust rules because we have the recording process. So if we pass away, we don't have to go through the probate court to verify whether it is authentic or not, because otherwise, if it is not authentic, I will not go to the government or the corresponding financial institutions to change the ownership or beneficiaries to trust. So I use the recording process when I am still alive to switch with the process of probate court after my passing away. So it's much easier to make the recording when I am still alive instead of for the government to guess whether something is my real mind after my passing away. So it can save on the time, money, and privacy. So compared to the will, a trust can help us to save a lot of trouble for our loved ones. And on the other hand, the will only works when we pass away. It only controls when we pass away about who gets what. It doesn't really help like when we are comp incompetent. So if we are incompetent, still the government will control our assets and our families cannot control it without appropriate authorization. But the trust doesn't only work when I pass away. I can trust my loved ones, trusted ones, to make my financial decisions if I am incompetent. So a trust works both when I pass away and when I am incompetent. And a will only works when I pass away. So the trust can cover more than the will. I would say a trust is a more powerful tool to protect our assets compared to will when it comes to our incompetence or when we pass away. Thank you. Got it. Okay. That's interesting. So it's just the trust is an added uh, level of protection that right. goes beyond the will. Okay. Um, so the next question, besides avoiding the tedious process of probate court, does a trust have any other advantages over a will? It sounds like you already answered part of this question, but if there's anything else that we're missing, please let me know. Absolutely. Trusts absolutely have more advantages over a will because like when we pass away, the will ex expires, the money goes to our families. And if our families, for example, my assets go to my son and my son has creditors like owe money to others or gets divorced, the creditors and ex-spouse will force my son to use my money to pay off the debts or to be divided in the divorce court. But if I have a trust, if I pass away, I can 
requires assets to stay in my trust. The trust doesn't expire with my passing away. So I can see my son can only use the assets according to the trust rules surviving me. So for example, I can say I want the money to go to my son, but my son only. If my son has creditors, if my son gets divorced, the creditors and divorce cannot take the money away from my son or from my family. So he will be protected. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I can give him some restrictions as well. For example, I can see you can only use $30,000 per year from the trust property. So you cannot use all of the assets in one sitting. So you have to use the money little by little. So that's restriction, which can help my son to manage and use my assets more smartly. And also, I can use irrevocable trust to avoid my own creditors. Like if I owe money to myself, like I can use irrevocable trust to avoid my own creditors. Or on the other hand, if I have assets beyond the threshold for estate tax, right now the federal estate tax threshold is $13.61 million per person. But if I have anything more than that, I can put it in the irrevocable tax avoidance trust to avoid estate tax. Mm -hmm. So besides whatever we have mentioned before, the trust can help us to protect our families against their creditors and spouse and regulate how they use our assets even when I pass away. And also irrevocable trust can help us to protect against our own creditors and to save on the estate tax. So I would say a trust is a very powerful asset protection tool and we should know more about it to know how to use it to the best extent to protect us protect our assets and protect our families. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, definitely. Um, it sounds like everybody should be considering starting a trust after that response. Um, are there different kinds of trusts and different kinds of wills? And what are the um, pros and cons for different types? Or I guess the most common ones. Right. A will is like a black and white paper, like we have mentioned about who gets what. And after our passing away, like we have mentioned, we have to go to the probate court to finish the verification process. And if we have trusts, we have two choices, revocable trust and irrevocable trust. Mm -hmm. For the revocable trust, we do whatever we want to do right now. And when we pass away, we have made arrangements in advance. So our families will take over the assets according to our trust rules and they will be protected against their creditors, their spouse, so they have actual protection and regulation. And for the irrevocable trust, we give up the rights to our loved ones, to the beneficiaries of the trusts, like our children, our parents, our siblings, while I am still alive and competent. So it means I give up the rights right now. In exchange for the benefits that if I have creditors, I don't need to use my money to pay off debts. And if I have estate tax, I don't have to pay estate tax. So that is exchange of benefits. I don't use the assets, but I get extra protection against our creditors and tax. So whether we want to choose revocable or irrevocable trusts really depends on what kind of protection we want to have whether I can give up the rights to the assets right now. So that is a case-by-case -case issue. If you are interested in this area, our law firm can give you more information in this area as well. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so what are the common trusts that married versus unmarried couples obtain? Let's say, for example, they buy a house. What is your recommendation for a married couple versus unmarried? Yeah, so no matter whether it is for married or unmarried couples, like I would say you need to understand whether you want to own the assets together or separately. Mm -hmm. So if we want to own it together, it means if in the future, no matter whether we break up for unmarried ones or we divorce for married ones, like we will get the assets half and half instead of in other percentage, not 30 to 70%, not 20 to 80 percent, but 50 to 50. So whether we want to do that. So if we want to do that, we can have a joint trust together. And if we don't want to do that, perhaps I want to have 80 percent. Well, my other half wants to get like 20 percent. So we need to have two trusts 
to separate it like by percentage. And also if we have a joint trust, we will like if I pass away, the money will belongs to him. If he passes away, the money belongs to me. Only when both of us pass away, the money will go to other people. For example, the children, the parents, other loved ones. So if we have separate trusts, we have more flexibility. I can see if I pass away, the money should go to my children instead of my spouse or my boyfriend. And he can do the same thing. So we really need to know whether we want to own the assets 50-50% and if we pass away, the money goes to the other person first or we want to own it in a different percentage or I want my assets to go to other people than my the significant other. So if we want, like we own it together and the surviving spouse or surviving one gets everything, we have the joint trust. But if we want to own it like in a different percentage, or like I want my assets to go to other people than the significant others, I will tell the um, clients, so perhaps we need to have the separate trust, one for husband or uh, boyfriend, the other for the a girlfriend or the wife. So it depends on our needs. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So it sounds like when uh, there's a couple or a family involved, they'll come to you for a consultation and you recommend what the best route is based on their needs. Right. So we do have free Zoom consultations. So if our clients need to have one, we can provide such consultations. And also like for the couples who want to have some separate rules, but they don't want to divide assets, we have another option, like they, ha they can have a joint trust right now. But if one of them passes away, the other one gets remarried, then the deceased spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend's parts will go to the families, like the uh, parents or the children directly, just to protect against the remarriage. So we do have different options depending on different needs. Thank you. Okay. Great. So it sounds like the uh, whatever the client needs, it can be done in terms of the specifics of what happens, you know, for unpredictable scenarios in the future, right? You you have a solution and it's all spelled out in the trust. Absolutely. We are very ready to help you with the most suitable trust for you. Yes. Okay. And uh, one last question, and this is related to real estate. So um, I know that every state has different laws surrounding this, but generally, do you know, um, in in the case of a probate sale or um, a, a sale, an estate sale where there is no clear explanation of where the assets are going, um, does the seller have to disclose the condition of the home? Let's say, for example, if they didn't ever live in the house, if it was a rental property or if it was in a state sale purely. Yeah, some sellers, like when they sell the houses in the probate, they will just sell it as it is. Like they will not give any warranty of the conditions or the quality of the housing because they don't have the ability or the competence to do that because that is not their house. Perhaps they haven't put their boots over there or they haven't lived there for a long time. The house belongs to their parents, their grandparents, their relatives, their friends, but it is not their house. So they don't know a lot about that. And the government and the law cannot require them to know the details just like the homeowners because it is on fire. So in the probate court sales, usually the houses will be sold like as it is. So the buyers sometimes will feel hesitant to buy such a house because they are worried about the quality of the houses without the warranty from the homeowners because the homeowners already passed away. So that's why I will say perhaps a trust will help us to solve the problem because in the trust, we don't have to go to the probate. The deceased people have arranged their loved ones, their trusted ones to be the trustees to manage the assets. So the trustees will sell the house if necessary after the deceased people pass away. And in this way, because they have arrangements in advance, so they can talk with the deceased people when they are still alive about how the houses are like, how they want the house to be sold out, 
whether mm -hmm. there is some condition or issue over there. So they will know more about the uh, housing conditions because of the arrangements in advance. So they will not face the situation or the difficulty setting the houses in the future because of the worries or the concerns of the potential buyers. So I would say, yeah, a trust does help us to promote sales of the houses after our passing our way. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Well, that was it. Um, I think those were the most common questions that my clients usually ask me. And uh, in the future, I can direct them straight to you and they can have a consultation. Um, but that thank you so much, Lynn. That was very educational. Um, and to everyone who's watching, if you need any estate planning assistance, um, I'll link Lynn's information in my description. And uh, if you're looking to buy or sell real estate, then definitely subscribe and follow for more content and reach out to me. We can have a great conversation about real estate. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.